you're here. Thank you for coming at um, this lunchtime meeting. We are, it's, I think it's a very important conversation to have, so we're really happy that you showed up. Um, my name is Jackie Knight. I'm the Director of Continuing Education, and um, we're very, I'm very happy that um, Jen, Cole, and Cindy Smith approached me with this, this um, idea to talk about this because you know this on this um, is on everyone's mind, and it's these. Although you know there are many reasons for war for conflict, these things that we're going to talk about today are some of the reasons, or some contribute to these things. So um, I'm sure everyone here knows Jen Cole, who teaches for the undergraduate program and also for continuing ed and uh, in eating for the environment and natural resources for the artists. And Cindy Smith, who teaches queer studies and we're both offering these classes in the summer. And we're really happy that they teach these classes for us and, and we're looking forward to what they have to say today. So I'm not gonna say anything more. Jen. Would be nice if I unmuted probably. Thank you so much, Jackie. Thank you for hosting. You're always so supportive of us. And um, thank you to everyone who's here. And um, it speaks highly of you all for being here at this time of the term with all you have going on. Thank you for, uh, for being here. So um, we want to keep this pretty light and as an informal kind of discussion, although we have some slides, nobody needs to see more PowerPoint and more Zoom. So um, this I'll tell you, what is this? Um, Oh, spotlighted. Okay. Sorry, I'm getting these pop up things. I'll tell you started as a conversation between Cindy and I, and Cindy and I are very good friends. And when this whole thing started, um, I saw Ukraine flags popping up all over our neighborhood. We both live in Dorchester. And I said, Cindy, you see all these flags that are going up everywhere. And I started to kind of um, editorialize on this. And Cindy, as an historian, editorialized kind of back to me and and I thought we have to give a talk about this we have to figure out how to get people to understand that maybe flying a Ukraine flag is not the best thing you can do so um, I wrote this this um, talk description and I said we're going to tell you six things that you can do and uh, we figured out the six things literally at uh, 1257. So <laughs> we wrote this talk just today and thank you for coming and I hope that you'll you'll uh, enjoy it. So we are obviously, uh, we are going to be talking about Ukraine and the Ukraine crisis. I'm trying to figure out how to, there we go. Okay. So um, in general, uh, we want to also acknowledge these horrors, all of the things you see on TV and Cindy will be talking about that, but uh, we're not going to be showing you all sorts of horrible things, but we want to absolutely acknowledge that there are displaced people, almost 8 million people are displaced either in country or outside of the country as a result of this. So in a nutshell, everything our society uses comes from agriculture, from mineral resources, or from energy. And we'll talk more about that as well. Whether you're talking about fibers, these are, um, if they're synthetic, they're grown from crude oil. If they are natural, they've been agriculture in nature. And as you'll see, Ukraine has a, an enormous wealth of these three things, agriculture, minerals, and energy. Cindy's going to talk about the history, and I'll talk about the resources from a science point of view. Increasingly, as we have a population growing and affluence growing, that can lead to scarcity of some of these things. And no country is self-sufficient. No country has ever been self-sufficient with regard to agriculture or minerals or energy. So when there's regional availability, that leads to global strife and war. It's that simple. So um, when Cindy and I were talking about this, she started to tell me about the flag. So Cindy, why don't we uh, turn it over to you for a minute to talk about the flag? Well, one of the things about the flag, and we were saying, we were just saying this morning is that one of the things that, that people might be surprised that, that people who are in our line of work do, that academics do, is that we talk about our fields in the middle of, of casual conversations. 
And, and we do this back and forth all the time when we're talking about what we do in our daily lives, we start talking about things like science and history and power. And we were talking about the proliferation of lights on houses and flags on houses where people might not have known what the Ukraine was or where Ukraine was or what the Ukrainian-Russian conflict was until about five weeks ago. And then all of a sudden on the houses on our block and in most people's neighborhoods and in t-shirts and in bracelets and in uh, public places, everybody saw the colors. And what the colors stand for, uh, the colors of the flag of Ukraine on the left is actually taken right out of the landscape the flag actually comes from a 13th century war banner uh, from Kievan Rus, medieval Russia, uh, medieval Ukraine. And it is the color of the sky of the Ukraine and the wheat of the Ukraine. And the wheat is one of the number one um, industrial agricultural exports of Ukraine right now. And I can get Jen to talk about that a little later, but the, the blue, uh, and the yellow are taken directly out of the Ukrainian landscape. I thought that was so cool. I had no idea about that. So um, that was one of the, the, the neatest things I've learned about this. So Cindy's going to also talk about the, the culture briefly, because Cindy, we have 36 slides and these people want to go somewhere better. I know. So, I know. so the, <laughs> the culture is actually quite ancient. The, the um, It comes from... And when we're talking about resources, we're talking about uh, minerals, we're talking about metals, we're talking about agricultural that um, is, has been industrial from the Bronze Age and previously. Sometimes if you are at all familiar with ancient history, the Scythian and Sarmatian cultures are the what we know as the Amazons today. Uh, uh, Sarmatian, Parthian uh, gold was quite uh, valuable. The horse and uh, the horse was probably domesticated in this part of the world. Um, uh, horsemanship, the invention of the stirrup, metals, gold, and uh, there was a warlike culture. And I'll tell you, if you look at the uh, the drawing on the left and remember that for a moment, I'm going to get to that in a later slide. But metals, horsemanship, war, uh, weaponry, and we can talk about that later when we talk about metals and minerals, because this was culture that was prized by the surrounding communities, and the surrounding areas and tribes were all looking to both uh, invade and be invaded by the culture that later became Ukrainian culture, and we can go to the next. So this pattern of invasion, agriculture, metals, minerals, uh, we've all become familiar with this. The invasion that's taken place currently has been the same pattern along the east region, which is the Donbass region now from the west uh, and into the uh, industrial north where the, um, uh, the nuclear power plants are now, Chernobyl and the other one uh, whose name I can't remember, but the same patterns of invasion from Russia from Belarus uh, and Poland and Lithuania and Romania when those uh, um, empires invaded Ukraine. The name Ukraine comes from uh, the word borderlands and it used to be uh, in our uh, lifetimes, the, the country was called the Ukraine. It no longer is. That article was dropped because it didn't want it to be didn't want to be referred to as the borderlands in translation. So now we just refer to it as Ukraine as a separate political ent entity. But Russia's ambitions now is to gain a separate area uh, annexed to Russia along the eastern border and with uh, a, a sea access for trade through Crimea. It's the same pattern of invasion that has happened for over 5,000 years. Yeah, you sent me, when I asked Cindy, because I'm not an historian, um, I asked Cindy, why now? And she sent me this great document. If anyone wants it, send me an email and I'll send it to you of going from 3,500 years ago from looking at the Kievan Rus, I don't even know how to pronounce some of these things, all the way That's up right. to today and why Putin decided now. So, um, well, we're also talking about resources as power. And whenever you find a war, 
whether it's between neighbors or between countries, it's usually about resources. And the resources might be different. And the resources now might be nuclear. And the res or the resources might be food, or the resources might be energy. The resources might be metals. The resources might be uh, minerals. We were talking about lithium this morning. If, uh, if, if the Russians are feeling stressed about resources, they are going to go to war to make sure that they can secure the resources. And they, I was telling you that they said um, two days ago, I believe, that the Russian military said, we, our original intent was to set up an Eastern corridor down to crime, through Crimea to the Black Sea, through the Sea of Azov. And that's to make sure they can secure trade routes, minerals, metals, and the um, tech area in the east. And if you look, the, here's the contrast. Remember I said to look at the picture on the left of the Scythian woman. Here's the same culture on the left, the, um, the crafts, the, the fabrics. Uh, my math start students will recognize sort of the, the fabric type uh, craft folk art uh, in the, uh, the headdresses and the fabrics. And then the East is also known for the technology, which is also what um, President Putin wants to secure in the East, the mines that Jen can talk about now, and the East, the technology, the digital technology, as well as um, fossil fuels like coal and the metals that are in the East. That's what they're trying to secure, as well as the trade routes to the, to the ocean. And the tech, right? Yes, the tech. Let's see what comes next in our slide oh this is me okay. <laughs> so briefly you know when when talking about natural resources it's it's interesting because always it ends up being lists if you've taken a class with me before and lists of lists and lists of lists of lists and it gets overwhelming right who has it how much do they have where is it going that sort of thing but let me just tell you that the ukraine belong ah sorry cindy because i'm old ukraine no 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 the ukrainian <laughs> is fine right okay uh, it belongs to the leading mineral rock countries in the world. It has a very wide range of minerals. Ukraine is 0.4, so four tenths of 1% of the world in terms of Earth's surface. It only has eight tenths of 1% of the world's population. And it has 5% of the world's mineral resources. There are over 20,000 deposits of 200 different minerals in Ukraine. So there, uh, there are huge numbers of minerals. Uh, and I, again, sorry with the lists of lists, but I'm gonna show you some, some lists of these things. But you can see these are the top 10 commodities that are, um, that are exported in Ukraine. And I'll show you some of these, these uh, pictures in the next couple of slides. But let's look just briefly because this is a fun talk, although, hey, we forgot to tell you you're getting a pop quiz at the end. Um, so I hope you're taking notes. Coal. Coal is the only hydrocarbon fossil raw material that, that can meet the future and the present energy needs in Ukraine for the next 500 years, potentially. So they have a lot of coal and it takes a leading place in the, the fuel and energy balance in Ukraine. They also export a lot. So they have- for Russia, they are the number one state that fuels Russia and Russia's infrastructure depends on coal. Cool. Yeah. So uh, when I talk about numbers, which again, not, not a big deal if you don't remember them, if you're not a numbers person, but I'll talk about numbers <laughs> in a volume sense. And that's the total amount that's estimated in the country. So Russian coal reserves, sorry, uh, Ukraine coal reserves are estimated at almost 120 billion tons. You probably don't even have a feel for that, but it's huge. And it's concentrated in the Donetsk region. So it can last, some, some optimistic estimates say that it can last for 570 years. And this is an old, uh, old, old uh, mining uh, material because we started they started mining in ukraine for coal in 1795 so then also oil natural gas they have 150 almost 150 million tons of oil uh 1200 barrels of natural gas almost 80,000 um tons of gas condensate so there's a lot of oil and natural gas there's also about 2,500 peat deposits that account for um, uh, over 2 billion tons of peat. Um, so just today, Cindy told you, it, it came out that it was announced in the paper that it's uh, during this war, um, 
you know, it was s supposed to be about other things. And I was always fighting with people about what this is about. This morning, uh, Russia uh, announced that it has uh, decided, Cindy, you can talk about that piece. What did Russia just announce? that it was just about the, uh, taking over the east and getting a corridor through the the Donbass region region the eastern states the eastern slice of Ukraine down through Crimea to the Black Sea through the Sea of Azov so basically giving Russia politically and resource wise uh, a land corridor to the sea. To and then you said to today also that Russia decided to stop trading uh, natural gas to Poland and Bulgaria, which we'll see yeah. are two places that are accepting the refugees. Um, yes, iron, exactly. uh, along with Russia and actually Australia, Ukraine has the largest iron ore reserves in the world. So lists of lists that can tell you why we use iron for what it's used, you know, beyond the scope of just today's discussion. But they are almost 29 billion, sorry, yeah, billion tons of iron in Ukraine. And so there are significant amounts of iron in this country. Lithium, United States, if any of my military guys are here, um, the the United States has a love affair with electric vehicles. I don't agree with it at all for many reasons beyond the scope of this class, but or this talk. But we have this love affair with electric vehicles. What is the mineral? What is the material that is, among others, the battery in uh, electric vehicles? Lithium. And Ukraine deposits could be as much as 500,000 tons. And the, there's different forms. So you'll see lithium carbonite and petalite. Don't worry about that. It's just forms of, um, of uh, lithium. And uh, the director of the National, Account National Intelligence Council's Environment and Natural Resources Director <laughs> said that uh, lithium may not be the reason for the invasion, but there's a reason why Ukraine is so important to Russia. And the Donbass region that Cindy told you about is doubly strategic because not only does it account for about 20% of Ukraine's GDP, it also has huge lithium reserves. The importance of lithium, it is one of the key metals, not only in electric vehicles, but in the digital transition. It's called white gold. It's essential in the production of things like car batteries and all sorts of electronic gadgetry. So there are a lot of, um, of lithium deposits in Ukraine and the price for this is uh, this is the price here, and this, I just pulled this off this morning. The price for lithium has risen by more than four hundred and forty percent in the last year alone. Looking at benchmark mineral mineral indices, so there, you know, if that's not enough, um, there are a host of other mineral resources. Manganese, largest reserves of manganese in Europe, second largest in the world. Copper, they have about 25 million tons of copper. Titanium, largest reserves of titanium in all of Europe. There are 15 major deposits in Ukraine. Uranium, they are also the largest in Europe, uranium deposits. They have 2% of world uranium reserves, about almost, almost uh, 48,000 tons of uranium. Doesn't take much to do what we need to do with uranium. Mercury, 2% of the world's reserves. This is crazy for the size of this country. They are fifth in the world for mercury reserves. They have about 30,000 30, 30, uh, 30, tons. They have about 35,000 tons of gold. There are huge reserves of potash salts. Um, there are lots of building materials, things like chalk and limestone and marl, gypsum, clays. Their reserves are very large and diverse. They're distributed pretty uniformly throughout the whole country. Kaolin deposits, you, uh, you folks who are ceramics people, they have huge amounts of kaolin deposits that are all over the, the um, country. Also large amounts of building stones, uh, including really high quality facing stones. If you have a stone that, um, that is beautiful for the outside of a building, there's a lot of them that chances are could have come from Ukraine, granites especially. Also lots of precious stones, ornamental stones. Um, there's there, uh, uh, deposits of things like pearl and opal and amethyst, smoky quartz, rock crystal, jasper, et cetera. Uh, Ukraine leads Europe in hydrominerals and thermal water. They have about 200 deposits of mineral waters. And so two things with this. First of all, if you have mineral waters, it's very hot. And so that can make for hydropower, uh, so, sorry, for geothermal energy. So energy that is considered renewable, but then also when the water's hot, it has a lot of minerals dissolved in it. So when it comes to the surface and cools, 
it will have a concentrated amount of these and many other minerals. So this is a picture of in Donetsk, an empty uh, basin of coal. So if you look to the back, this is something that is frequently seen outside of cities and towns, huge piles of, it's called tip or, um, or coal spoils, whatever you wanna call it. This is the, the byproduct of mining. You see a mining operation in the back and then you see these coal spoils. So uh, mining, 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 mining. Also agriculture. Ukraine is the, uh, the world's leading agricultural exporter of sunflower oil and sunflower seed. It's the largest world exporter of sunflower oil. It is a 40% share of global exports last year. So huge amounts of that. Also grain, you see these grains that are being exported by destination. Uh, here is a picture of yeah the, the amount of exports. And then this is the amount of exports by destination. You see importers and exporters in the European Union of grain. And I just wanna highlight this, that there is a lot of um, export of different grains that are going out. Ukraine's the second largest supplier of grains, including corn, wheat, rye, barley, oats. And it is a, a very big um, supplier of, of um, grain for middle-income countries. So Cindy, you want to talk about the ports and um, implications of what's going on? Where are the port, where, where, where's all this resource going in and out of? Yeah, so the, that's the this Eastern corridor here. We've heard about Mariupol lately and Odessa and Mariupol is the one that's been uh, under the heaviest fire lately and under the biggest contention. And that's the, the port that's on the Crimea side. Um, uh, of, of the Black Sea there and has been the direct target and the target of uh, the, the, um, the multiple shellings that we've heard of and some of the hand-to-hand -hand fighting. And, you know, the implication there for, for Russia is that they are trying to set up the land corridor. Crimea has was annexed in uh, 2013. There's been an eight-year ongoing war there. And again, um, Politics is power. Politics is about resources, politics, power, resources. If there's a power move, it's probably about resources because if you have um, power, if you are in control of power, it's because you're in control of resources. And there's no power historically like controlling a port. A port city means that you are in control of being able to trade resources coming in and out of your country. Russia doesn't have uh, many ports to the rest of the world. And so to be able to control this port, this is what uh, annexing Crimea was all about in 2013, starting to uh, annex Crimea in 2013 for them because it, it gives them a port to the South. It gives them a warm water port. And so uh, Mariupol and Odessa are key to their plans if they can get Crimea and then they can get the Donbass region, they get not only the, the, the fossil fuel producing and the metal and mineral producing areas in the Eastern region, they get that land corridor adjacent to their own geographical territory, um, but they get the production and they get the port to the sea, they get to be able to control in and out of all those materials in and out, that's power. And that's a guarantee that's also that's also, um, a, you know, more of a um, uh, of a corridor in between themselves and NATO. Sorry, I went back one by accident. Yeah. Okay. And Cindy, this is your wheelhouse as well with your activism, your freshman seminar, your queer studies class. Well, we were talking about, um, uh, you know, the narratives, and you can't necessarily say to people who are outside the conflict that it's about power and resources. Uh, you can say it's about power, but you can't necessarily sell the narrative in your media about, um, about resources because people get tired. So what sells? What sells in media is human interest and nothing sells more than the women, children, and animals. So we get a lot of women, children, and animals because that the, you know, we, we talk about this in my activism class a lot, personal stories sell. And we talk about this in activism and we talk about it in queer studies and we talk about it in journalism classes. How do you sell 
a narrative if you're a government and you're trying to deal in resources and commodities. Well, you personalize it and you say, well, this is Putin's fault or this is the Russians' fault and Russians are evil or Putin's evil or he's an evil dictator or this, that, and the other thing. And then you show pictures of, uh, you know, people living in subways with their animals. And, you know, that's, that's a good way to get support for a war that you're going to fight anyway over resources. And it's very effective. And it's also true. And it's heartbreaking. And, uh, you know, we're not minimizing the humanitarian side of it. But we have to realize that at the same time, there are other issues going on. Um, what happens is, and we talked about this in, in, in the activism class, is the term, and if um, any of Jen's military folks are here, there's the term collateral damage. And the countries are going to go to war over resources and power anyway, but the term collateral damage means the loss of human life usually human life, animal life anyway, the loss of living beings over military and power objectives anyway. So what can we do to deal with the humanitarian crisis, which is a separate issue anyway? So um, we're gonna get to uh, what can we do or what can we do list um, so that we don't burn out on images like this, which make us feel horrible and helpless because there is a loss. It is. It's, it's awful. It's terrible. And we do, we all burn out. So yeah. you, you kind of talked about this. Yes. Yeah. So and then there are the communities uh, and usually in wars, what, what happens the most helpless, the most underrepresented and disenfranchised communities, uh, the ones who suffer under good times are the ones who suffer under bad times anyway, or who are at a loss uh, when things get worse. The most underrepresented communities suffer uh, a greater uh, sense of disenfranchisement. So um, the you know women, children who are up, uh, underrepresented anyway, animals who may have a hard time uh, anyway, the homeless, um, people who are uh, underclass, not working, unemployed, um, underemployed. Um, it, people who are outside the system to start with. So LGBTQAI uh, plus um, don't have a great representation in Ukraine or in Russia. Um, this is a picture of pride from Ukraine a couple of years ago. It's um, a traditional country with um, uh, based in Orthodox religion which is not a great representation uh, of, of, of those rights. So when there's a war on, uh, it tends not to recognize rights that are outside the parameters of traditional society. And we can take the next slide. Thank yeah. You. So same thing with students, right? Same thing with students. There are a lot of international students in um, uh, in Ukraine. They go because the, the culture welcomes them in general in peacetime and uh, because the um, tuition out of, out of international students uh, find welcome and the uh, tuition for international students is very good, very low. So there were uh, a number of students, uh, a lot of students, mostly from India and from uh, the Middle East who got stuck in Ukraine when the war first started, had trouble getting home. Uh, and a lot of them are refugees, African, Indian, and Middle Eastern. And uh, so that was a situation there. Yeah, not good. So here's the moment you've all been waiting for. What can you do about this? And, you know, it's, it's tough to try to talk about this in a half an hour and then give you some meaningful directives on what you can to, do should you elect to. But here we have a pop quiz and we're not going to take um, your answers and we're not certainly not going to grade you, but uh, think about the things that you can do and that you've seen people do. And um, these are some of the things that you have seen people do. So just jot down or think in your mind about whether this is a good idea to help the, this whole situation, okay. buying a Ukrainian flag, 
Uh, should you learn about the region, learn all there is, because the news, as Cindy said, the news doesn't give you this history. And I'm not a history person. I went to public school and they canceled history when I was growing up. So I don't know anything about history. I know virtually nothing about geography too. So um, I have had to learn a lot about this region. Uh, should you give money? You see a lot of people collecting money for Ukraine. Should you get on, I don't know, whatever you youngsters are on for social media these days, TikTok, Instagram, I'm still back in the dark ages with Facebook, but should you, um, should you voice your opinion? Uh, should you be voting? How should you be voting? Um, should you fight the Keystone Pipeline? There's a lot of people, especially MassR folks, that are up in arms about the Keystone Pipeline. Similarly, should you be protesting mining in national lands in the United States? Are these good solutions for the Ukraine crisis? Um, now I'm going to be a little bit snarky because uh, you're, you're all here to be um, to, to learn and to kind of doing it informally. Should you stress out, go eat a whole bunch of meat? Uh, should you, Cindy, go purchase four more TVs so you can watch the news in each room of your house? <laughs> she didn't buy another TV, but <laughs> not yet. Uh, should you? <laughs> She's an obsessive news watcher. Should you drive around your car with your Ukraine bumper stickers to, so that you can spread the word and be an activist then? So it's a 10 question, multiple choice. I hope you're writing down. We're going to give you the answer key for the, the last little bit. Um, if you see someone Russian, are they the enemy? Are they someone that you should walk up to and be like, why are you doing this? So let's look at all of these. And, and the first thing is the, the Ukrainian flag. That's what started this whole talk and started me and Cindy talking, uh, Cindy and I talking, because I thought, oh, this is ridiculous. I was so upset by all these Ukraine flags. Why? Not because I don't care, quite the contrary, but because Ukrainian flags are made of nylon or rayon or some synthetic product, which you fashion and fibers people know is the byproduct of crude oil, naphtha. It's processed, it's, it's, uh, it's created from the byproduct of crude oil and it may be Russian oil. So we're using Russian oil perhaps to make rayon to sew a Ukraine flag and these people also, you know, I'm sure those of you at Mass Art about fast fashion and people are, you know, being paid $5 a day, not an hour, but a day in grueling 10 hour time periods, making, you know, 50 cents an hour to sew these flags. And then they stitch them together. Um, using Russian oil for energy potentially, and then put them into plastic bags using uh, Russian oil potentially as, the, bio, as the, uh, the raw material for the flag to go into to ship them halfway around the world to come to your door so you can put it up and say, I support Ukraine. Well, you supported Ukraine, sure. And activism is really important. That's Cindy's wheelhouse. But you supported Ukraine by using a lot of Russian oil. Is that the way to go? Eh, no. Could you, you know, should you be engaging in activism? Absolutely. Again, Cindy will talk about that, but I tried to wear yellow today so it could be yellow and blue. It's important. I'm not saying that Ukrainian flags are not important to do, but maybe if you have something that uh, you already have, that would be good. And remember that the, this country, the U.S. is still purchasing Russian oil through December. Yeah. Yep. We haven't stopped and yeah. they haven't stopped. And you know, December. who cares? Who cares? Right. Because the thing is, there's an unlimited market for Russian oil in right. China and in India. And Just in India. We stop buying it doesn't mean anything. It's symbolic it it's, and it's it. about votes. Whatever. Right. So, symbolic. you know, that's what, that's, that's what we're trying to do here. To separate out what is truly a good initiative versus what is window dressing. Right. So this is a course, this is a talk that's sponsored kindly with Jackie and Brenna through uh, PCE. Should you educate yeah. yourself? Absolutely. Should you be able Absolutely. to figure out what is going on? How can I really help? What are the issues? And uh, this summer, I'm teaching eating in the environment. I'm teaching the, I think, the most important course any artist should take, which is natural resource materials of artists, where you learn about materials and we learn about energy and agriculture too. Cindy's teaching queer studies, and we're all we're we're going to be focused on the unfolding situation in Ukraine and what goes on. So PCE, big plug for them uh, for all the classes, affordable, high quality education that you can do from home. So should you be um, engaging in educate, educating yourself and then others? 
Absolutely. And Brenna has put the link in the chat. Thank you, Brenna. Oh, and yeah. so take a look at PCE. They're a great way to get for mass art. They're a great way to get your um, uh, uh, your credits done in uh, in liberal arts. So, yeah, too. requirements. So, yeah. And a great way to educate yourself on this stuff and to learn about power and to learn about resources and to learn about the world. Absolutely, Everybody. to get your requirements done. Yeah. So uh, money, uh, you know, you're all, most of you are college students. You don't have a lot of money to go donating and you should not feel guilty if you're not donating money to every single Ukraine organization there is. If you choose to donate money, if you have some money, it is really important for you to do your research. And Cindy, you were going to put something in the chat from your student. Um, yeah. If, uh, if Alexandra is here and you want to put um, women's strike in the, uh, in the chat a website for them, it's important to do uh, your research as Jen said, and to look for organizations who can actually get the resources to uh, where you want them to go rather than a place down the block whose heart might be in the right place, but who isn't going to be able to get their resources to the actual um, to the actual uh, folks who need them. Yeah, and side side note, which I talk about uh, donations in natural disasters class a lot. They don't need your used stuffed animals. They don't need your prom gown. Not donating your personal effects. That's not going to help. They need cash. So if you're going to donate something, nobody needs to ship your your discarded clothing over there. So cash. Oops. So um, should you be voicing your educated opinion? Yes, um, but it has to be educated, right? Um, one of the things that I think should be um, really out there is the fact that we have 20 billion, that's an unfathomable number again, dollars per year in energy subsidies that make oil and gas and coal super cheap. This is why people, we don't have renewables that are around in this country. This is why you don't see wind turbines and solar panels in places that you should, not because the technology isn't well vetted, not because we can't do it, but because the subsidies that are involved in agriculture and in energy are the two biggest solutions to pretty much any problem. I always say that in any of my sustainability classes, I can fix all environmental problems in two quick issues or two quick steps and I'll be out of a job happily. Withdraw the subsidies. Do you know about subsidies? Again, beyond the scope of this class or this little talk, but you the subsidies, you should be screaming in the streets about agricultural and about energy subsidies. Absolutely be screaming about that. That is the heart of so much of this. Once you're educated, also vote. Think about the issues. Think about elected officials who have good, clear policies and elect them. We live in this wonderful democracy, this unbelievably fabulous country, and we should be using our tremendous power of voting to have the right people be, um, be there. Also, expressing your opinion to elected officials. I write fan mail um, to a lot of different politicians, um, and you know, just as much as I say, hey, have you thought about doing this better? They listen. We are the reason yeah. they're there. Yeah, and politicians have more direct access than we do, um, which is a good reason to write to them and, and vote for them. And you might not like the system, but that's also the way to change the system, which is uh, from within the system. And remember, we talked about that in my classes when Paul came in, that the way to do it is through legal means. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, and, the, and the, uh, if I could just say for a minute, Jen, before you start yeah. on this, that um, people are talking in the chat about, um, you know, donations and donation burnout, being asked for, you know, getting burnout on, on the issue and being asked for donations from every which way. That's why it's important to do your research. Can you, and, can you and see that on the sure. screen? I'm looking at the chat. Can you all see this, the chat that I just pulled up on the screen? No, you can't. Okay. Um, uh, we do get burnt. We we do get burned out when everybody is asking for donations, and that's why the way the way to curb that is really to do your research and make sure you're doing what you would like to do. Do your research on it. Um, everybody's asking for donations. Everybody is you know ask is asking to to saying that they have the key to this, and it's it's very difficult, and and we understand that. 
but yeah. research is the key to it. Absolutely. So with the pipeline, Cindy, you have to figure out how to walk me out of this, um, this hole that I'm about to go down. When I teach any energy courses, which I teach here and I teach at, at multiple schools, I get really upset about people bitching about the Keystone Pipeline, complaining about drilling in the Arctic National Wildlife Refuge, uh, complaining about fracking. Half the time, they don't even know what it is. So that goes back to educating yourself about the science as well as the policy. But you cannot say, don't frack. I'm sorry, you can't do it. You can say, don't frack. Instead, do this. We in, this, in, in the United States have this demand, all of us, we just assume that when we plug our devices in, the energy is going to come out as much as we want, whenever we want. And you can't store energy. You can't store it. You have to create it on demand. It's a very complicated and complex and fascinating, fascinating uh, system. Again, beyond the, the scope of today, but you cannot say, don't, um, don't drill in the Arctic National Wildlife to stop the Keystone and herald it as a great victory because it's unless you stop using fossil fuels or radically cut down on them, we're just going to get it from somewhere else. And now we have oil that's being shipped in huge tankers going halfway across the world when we could just get it here. And again, if my military guys are here and sorry, they're all, they're all guys, the ones that are in my class this term, um, you know, these these gentlemen are not able to see their daughter's eighth birthday because they are on the Arabian Peninsula and they are you know ringing Ukraine and Russia um, trying to make sure that we have access to these resources. So I don't personally see much wrong with domestic systems, domestic energy systems. Why should we be so entitled that we say we're not touching our air, water, and soil? We're going to outsource the disgusting and dirty and awful business of getting energy from Russia and elsewhere, and they don't have the environmental protections that we do, so that we can keep our land pristine, wholly entitled. That's awful. So you have the choice of not using energy, stop you know, using your devices, stop driving around, stop taking public transportation, or figure out how we can go through our energy future. And that does, I'm sorry, involve getting the things that we use in our country from our country. Same thing with mining on national lands. You hear, oh, you know, Trump, who uh, Trump has opened the Grand Escalante Grand Staircase to mining is so horrible. Let's go and fight. Great. You know what would be better if you stop using iPhones, if you stop using your iPad, if you give your MacBook back to the uh, the Mac, the Apple Store. If you um, educate yourself on what the, the, the atrocities in the Democratic Republic of Congo, you can't say, don't get minerals, don't bother our air, water, and soil if you're using these minerals. So what we have to do is get to the root cause and we have to figure out sustainable, this is where the industrial designers come in and, and designers in general, how can we keep doing what we're doing but enable those who come after us to do what we are doing, which is closed loop recycling, which is um, looking at uh, intensively recycling materials, which is zero waste things. So there are a lot of initiatives that, that I talk about in my classes that enable us to not have to mine because we are intensively recycling. But you can't just say, stop mining in our lands without saying, instead, do this. And so that goes and back this is to why I tell my students, you can't take activism and you can't take queer studies and talk about intersectionality and, and global theory and world systems theory without then taking climate change, natural uh, materials and learning what you have to teach them in your courses because they go together. You can't talk about the theory and you can't talk about alternative narratives and BIPOC narratives and intersectional action and global north and responsibility to the global south and integrating the world without understanding the science of it and how science, natural science and social science go together. And it's the only way out of the mess so that they need to take, if they've taken the courses that I'm privileged to offer right now, they need to take the courses that you offer and they're being offered this summer and this is the way to do it. And they're not being offered after that 
and and that's another story but we they need to take your courses to understand how to apply the theory that they've had and done very well at and now they need to learn the ramifications of it and it, it's the it's the opposite too that's why i like giving talks with you so much because the opposite is those of you who are science based you can sit in, and I always like to use this term, archive our demise. If you can sit and categorize where the minerals are, how much are used, how much are recycled, unless you do something with that through activism and through political means, then that's just for nothing. So it's the connections that are so powerful. Excellent. Yeah. So we talk, I, I joked about stressing out and eating a lot of meat. Um, here's the thing, animals that, which is what we eat, huge subsidies, um, we're running out of time. So just briefly, huge subsidies um, going into meat. And because, because of this, um, there's a lot of grain. Because of the Ukraine situation, um, the Midwestern farmers, this is the global aspect ripple effects, have to pay double now for animal feed, these commodity prices for corn and also fuel prices, diesel to power their heavy machinery. Corn right now is $8 a barrel. Maybe you don't have a feel for what that is. It's the highest in decades. Last year, it was $3 a barrel. So eating the environment, yeah, we learn about prices and that sort of thing. But um, because of Ukraine crisis, that's why meat is so high because of these supply chain issues. So yeah, don't stress out and eat a lot of meat. Um, you should be using all of these things judiciously, uh, joking with the drive around and um, you know with your bumper stickers. Um, we import a huge amount of oil, but so does in China and uh, India from, from Ukraine. So there's an unlimited market, as we said, for Russian oil. So what can we do? How can we get out of the subsidy situation? How can we step away from excessive use of crude oil? Please let this be, and this is the whole point in my mind to this talk and to thinking about the Ukraine, let this be a moment globally where we shift to renewable energy, where we shift and make this expedited transition. And there's a lot of signs that it is happening. So it's not something to, you know, sort of hand ring about. We've got to leverage this moment or all of these refugees, all of these people that you're seeing in the news are suffering and perishing in vain. We have to make this switch to a more sustainable world. Um, supporting refugees, tell Biden to welcome refugees, do so yourself. And obviously, uh, when we said should berate uh, people uh, who look like they're from Russia, absolutely you should not, uh, do not engage in xenophobia. People from Russia are suffering just as much as we are. And, and uh, I, in terms of watching this, um, certainly not as much as Ukraine. So we'll turn it over to questions now, but here's your answer key because uh, I said in the, the description for this talk, we we're gonna give you six things that you can do. Here are the six clear things. And if you took notes on what you got true and false, I put yellow there because of the whole college student piece. Most of you are college students. You can't afford to donate hundreds of thousands of dollars and nor should you feel guilty if you can't because you can do these other things take a summer class, um, voice your opinion, vote for elected officials, engage in energy and agricultural activism and be welcoming to refugees uh, in, in every way that you can. So um, I'll stop the share and would love to hear questions and comments from anyone. And Brenna, can you, um, you said that you could unmute people now. Yeah, everybody should be able to unmute themselves or feel free to put a question in the chat. Give people a minute if you have, yeah, put, put some chat things in if you want. Cindy, I'll read these um, from our James. What areas of Ukrainian history and geography are most useful in understanding why this is happening? All you, sister. Um, I'm sorry, Jen, could you read that again? Oh, sure. What areas of Ukrainian history and geography are most useful in understanding why this is happening. James, I'll send you the little document Cindy made, but can you talk about it for everyone who doesn't want to read the document, Cindy? Sure. Hi, James. Um, it's great to see you. Um, areas of history, you know, so my favorite are always um, 
ancient and medieval, but I, I, you know, and also for you, the religious history is fascinating. And I know that's something that you are uh, especially taken with. Um, so the medieval relig religious history, the Kievan Rus period, which is about uh, 800, the eighth and ninth centuries into the medieval period. Um, but I think in terms of why, why this is happening, you know, if you look at the overview, the repeated invasions, um, and, uh, you know, as Jen said, the, you know, why people invade, if you just look at the history of why various groups invaded, it's an interesting look, but for you in particular, Look at the Kievan Rus period at, through, which is ninth century through thirteenth century, and look at the uh, the start of the uh, Ukrainian Byzantine uh, of, of Byzantine uh, Christianity, because that's all tied in with the culture. Sorry, good question. Other questions or thoughts. Cindy, do you have anything you wanted to say if, as people are typing in the chat? And don't worry, we won't go a minute past. Um, to you know, I, I just, you know, I, I think it's important to talk about burnout. Uh, you know, again, with the with the with the war pictures, and uh, I'm going to date myself, but I'm reminded of Vietnam. And uh, you know, just uh, any time we get a conflict like this in the media, Sudan. Um, uh, you know, anytime you get something like this, where you get asked for, you get, you, you see the pictures in the media and you get asked for uh, donations over and over and over again. And then eventually within about two months, three months, it just sort of, it, you're, you're numb to it. And it, it you know, somebody raised a, a, a really good point, um, I think uh, about um, the repeated donations that somebody said in the chat in the Washington DC area. And it's really, it's really difficult to know you know, what is local, what's worthwhile. So there's a, there are organizations like Charity Watch that you can go to online to see who's vetted and who isn't. Uh, if you don't want to do your own research, you can go to charitywatch.org and see who most, most of the uh, organizations, the international ones on Charity Watch have, are, are vetted and they'll have their Ukraine donation sites right up on their first page when you go to them immediately. And it'll say donate to Ukraine now, depending on what you want to do. International Red Cross and Red Crescent, Doctors Without Borders, depending on what kind of donation you want to do. And again, we do know that most of you are, or many of you are college students, and that's not something that is uh, useful um, to you right now. But you can do something more useful along the lines or, or more local through, if you have any specific ties um, like Alexandra does, she put um, the um, the uh, uh, women's strike in the chat, and that sounds like an extremely useful organization. Again, because it's in Poland, it's already organized. They're already working in Ukraine, so look for people who are local groups that are local, organized, and already working on the ground there. And that but I don't want to. I don't want to. Yeah, I don't want to overstate the whole give, give, give because um, no, exactly. It's you know there are certainly you want to help those who are there, but there are bigger things that you can do that don't. There are bigger things that you money. can do. There are it, bigger things that you can do here if you want to do mouth. that. That's the that you can do. Right. Yep. So the women's strike organ organization that the, the the student was talking about is they tend to organize. They don't. It doesn't it doesn't tend to be all about giving. So look right. for groups that are organizing that are helping refugees here or that are doing things here especially for students who don't have money and it's not about giving, it's more about action. Yeah, so we have a, a bunch of other questions um, that are great. So um, social media burnout, Jennifer, absolutely. And um, Karen's asking some great questions. So Megan uh, asked, what are some of the less damaging resources and supplies instead of plastics to use to create cre Ukrainian flags? You know, chalk art, I think is good. Um, I, I was running, I run on the, the, um, the the harbor walk every day. And I saw the boathouse in the uh, the UMass, not UMass, whatever, the whatever Fox Point boathouse. And they put the boats that were, because they're all different colors of blue and yellow. Things you already have, that is always the way to go. Things you already have, if you, or, or you know, if you have old clothing that you can sew, 
Um, and anything that you already have, that's, I was saying to Jackie and Brenna before uh, you all came in, like I was trying to find a yellow scarf. Uh, oh, I said maybe to everyone. So things you already have, so less damaging things. Um, look for things that are natural in color. Look for things that are made here. But I would say art materials. I mean, it's different because you all are artists or many of you are artists. And I think you get a pass on using materials because you have dedicated your life to your craft. And so you all, if you make Ukrainian art, I'm all ears. I want to buy some of it. So uh, Megan, as an artist, you get a pass by whatever you want, because you're not, um, you're, you're doing that as, as your sort of life purpose is philosophical, really. So Karen, are there any, so oh, this is for you, Cindy, are there any small signs that we should be on the lookout for that are flags of rising conflict that may snowball into something drastic. A lot of my military guys are, are asking things like that too. Uh, what, what, and, and are looking, what, what is, what should we be looking for looming on the horizon? Do you have a crystal ball? Um, you know, I don't, but it came from one of your military guys and we agreed on this and that was the Taiwan China um, incident. And um you know, I, I certainly think that that is is a possibility. Well, because the the uh, that's a great question, and while while the U.S. and China were engaged with each other, um, Ukraine and Russia happened. It's always a great question, and I would also look for in the light of this talk where resources are scarce or being challenged that's where the next political move will come because power is all about resources. Where the next natural disaster is, which fits in with your work, Jen, where, where, where the next natural disaster happens, which we can't always predict, um, where the next scarcity is, where the next uh, outbreak of a pandemic is, where the next drought is, where, where everything that you write about that you work on, that's, yeah. that's where the next issue is or, or where the next need for lithium is or, or something like that. It, it, it's going to be about resources for one reason or another, or it's going to be China, Taiwan. Yeah. So one comment uh, based on Sophia, what you said, and then Karen, I'll leave you because we're, we're, we promise not to go a second over to uh, with another question for you, Cindy. So your question is, could rising tensions with Russia possibly cause a creative change in the approach to technology and resources? But I'll say, so if your, your, your electric vehicle thing is right on, you know, we can talk all day about this stuff. I hate electric vehicles. I hate them. They're awful. They're, the battery, if that goes, it's $5,000 to get it replaced. It's non-renewable mineral resources. If you have a Tesla, it's proprietary. You can't charge in any other's charging things. If you have a non-Tesla, you can't charge in Teslas. It's not standardized. It's, it's ridiculous. I'll tell you what I drive. I drive a diesel. We need to have a love affair with diesel cars. I get 52 miles per gallon in my car and I can use biodiesel. There are two charging or two um, biofueling stations, one in Stoughton and one in Everett. I can use French fry oil in my car, which is what Henry Ford intended the automobile to run on, on biofuel, peanut oil. So we've got to get away from this oil and we can. The only reason we're not is because of the, the subsidies. But I think electric vehicles are a terrifying misstep. Um, so Cindy, do you want to say anything about creative change? You got one more minute. Walking, yeah, so absolutely. Walk yeah. somewhere. You want to help Ukraine? Walk somewhere. Um, yeah. Yeah, and creative changes again, what you said about thinking more about local um, local energy. Absolutely, whether it's individual or local energy and not exploiting other parts of the world or global north, global south has to even out. Yeah, absolutely. We've got to get away from this mindset. And it's on the other end too, whole agricultural villages in China, in the Pakistan region, all over Africa have been turned into e-waste processing facilities. If you go to the mall or wherever and you see T-Mobile is offering you a new phone every year, that's how earth dies. <laughs> so keep your phones as long as you can. And yeah, we have to figure out how to do things domestically at all countries more than we have been. Stop outsourcing acquisition of minerals, acquisition of energy, 
from Ukraine, from Russia. And then on the backside, throwing our trash away. People were so upset because, oh, China stopped taking our plastic for recycling. Why should we have the, the residue of fossil fuels, which is plastic, be shipped halfway around the world to China so they can recycle it and send it halfway around the world to us with this oil. Are you kidding? So we are out of time. Thank you all so very much for coming. It really, again, speaks highly of you for coming at this time of the year. And I hope to see you somewhere down the line. Thank you very much to Jackie and Brenna at PCE for hosting. And uh, we look forward to continuing the conversation with anyone who wants to. Thank you. Thanks, Dennis. Yeah. We'll see you. Thank you. Thank you.